But without further ado, um, I'm going to hand you over now to our digital PR expert, Charlotte, who will introduce herself and talk you through today's session. Over to you, Charlotte. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, sorry about that slight technical issue. Um, but yeah, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, so today we're going to be talking all about digital PR and how you can build your brand in the digital age. Um, so as Dan said, my name is Charlotte Stephen. I'm a digital marketing manager here at Wagada Digital, um, and I'm also specialising in digital PR and link building. Um, I've left a little QR code up there if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and if you have any questions after the session today, feel free to drop me a message as well. So what we'll cover today, um, so you're going to gain a broad understanding on what digital PR actually is. We'll discuss how to formulate a strategic digital PR plan. And um, we'll think about the type of content you want to create for digital PR. And um, we'll discuss how SEO integrates into digital PR as well. And um, we'll show you how we do it in-house and we'll show you some case studies and examples as well. Um, and finally, we'll show you how you can report on your digital PR success. So to start with, what is digital PR? So digital PR involves securing high quality backlinks from different online publications that are relevant to your brand. So it's very different from traditional PR, which is more about getting coverage in print publications. So, for example, newspapers, things like that. Um, I know we actually have a few PR agencies on the call today, um, Bubble being one of those. We've worked with you in the past. So yeah, great to see you. Um, and the power of high quality backlinks is enormous. So getting these backlinks can really increase your overall domain authority and your referral traffic to your website. So by doing digital PR, you can really benefit from increased brand awareness, um, improved online reputation, and you can overall gain cre greater credibility in the digital world. So what do I mean when I reference high quality backlinks? So a high quality backlink is a link from a website that is credible um, and it's relevant to your brand. So you need to make sure that the links you're getting are from trustworthy sites. Um, so a rumor or yeah, a rumor that's been going around for a number of years is that um, you need to have loads of backlinks to make a difference to your organic performance. Um, but Google's John Miller actually said that the total number of backlinks a website has doesn't matter at all to the search algorithm, which I think is so important um, because, yeah, that's come from Google directly. So it's all about the quality of the links you're getting, not the quantity. So getting a backlink will really help to pass on signals of trust to Google that your website is a credible source. Um, so link building is a really great tactic for SEO. The more high quality backlinks you can get, the better signals that get sent to Google, which will really help with your organic performance as well. So again, really just to reiterate that point, it's not all about how popular the website you've got a link on is. It can be equally as powerful to get a link in a really niche relevant publication to your brand um, rather than millions of low quality links. So where do we actually begin? Um, so the first thing we always do is a competitor gap analysis. So link building has to be strategic. Um, so you really want to look at where your competitors have got links, where they might not have links, and really figure out what type of publications it is that you need to target. Um, so what we do is pull off a backlink audit for each of a brand's competitors. And we look at the amount of linking domains they have within each authority school bracket. So say for example, um, you look at one competitor and the majority of their links um, are from websites in between 30 DA and 40 DA, um, but you don't have any from websites with that domain authority score, that might be what you'll target. So we basically analyze the percentage of backlinks um, through the domain authority types and figure out what we actually need to target. 
So this diagram kind of shows you the different types of links you can target. So just to talk you through it, so you can focus on your size, so the amount of referring domains and backlinks you have. So if you don't have a backlink profile at all, but you don't have any links, that might be a good starting point. Um, you can focus on the strength of your link. So really trying to get um, more links with a higher domain authority score. You can focus on relevancy. So looking at local and industry niche publications that will really help boost your performance in your industry. And then finally, you can look at quality links. So they're, they're your tier one and national links. Yeah. Um, so say for example, you may have had a couple of links from really authoritative national websites such as the Daily Express, but you see that your competitors have a lot more links from smaller relevant publications to your industry. That might be where you're lacking and what you need to target. So just to give you some examples of relevant links, um, so say you're a care home provider, um, the Carer, which is an online publication, might be one that you really want to target as that's really niche to your industry. Um, and then another example is to say if you sell kitchens for different houses, um, a great publication to be featured on would be Ideal Home. And then just some examples of tier ones, national. So obviously the Daily Mail and the Daily Express. So these both have really high DAs. They're in the on um, the quality tier one and national links. So I've obviously talked a lot about domain authority, so I'm just going to explain what that actually is. So it's a metric you can use to see how credible a website is. So the score is out of 100 and it's determined by combining multiple factors, um, including the linking root domains and the total number of backlinks um, on a website and combining that in, into a single domain authority score. Um, so looking at this metric is really useful to compare websites or tracking the ranking strength of a website over time. Um, because, of, because obviously once your SEO increases, once your organic performance increases, your domain authority can increase as well. So there's a tool called Moz that you can actually use. Um, which can show you your page authority, your domain authority, the amount of linking domains you have and the amount of inbound links you have. Um, you can also track on here um, how many follow links and no follow links you have. Um, so yeah, I'd really recommend everyone looking at their backlink profile on Moz um, and just take a look at how you're performing at the moment and see if there's anything you want to increase there. Charlotte, someone's just dropped a message to me privately about if this is free or if you need to pay. And obviously, I think there's different gradings, isn't there? So someone was just yeah. asking about yeah, how to access it. Yeah, so it's free um, initially. I think you can obviously pay to get further insights. But yeah, doing a backlink audit is free. Um, so yeah, it's a really good tool. And you can also apply the Moz um, toolbar to your um, internet browser. So when you're looking on different sites, it can automatically come up at the top what um, DA score that site has, which is really beneficial. So I obviously just talked a bit about follow or no follow links, but to explain what those are, um, so there's two different types of links you can get, um, and the difference between them is just a bit of code in the back end. Um, so Google says that no follow links in general don't pass on the authority, but they can still provide brand recognition and referral traffic to your website. Follow links, on the other hand, can imply endorsement, so they can really pass on that link juice that the site you've got the link from already has. Um, so they can signal to Google that your site should be credited. Um, so again, this is all about SEO and how it works to really increase your organic performance. Um, no follow links, however, still really carry value. Unfortunately, we as PRs can't control whether a link we get is a follow or no follow. Um, some sites actually have a no follow policy. Um, so yeah, it's just important to bear in mind. Um, so I actually did some research and I found that Kaizen, who are quite a rep reputable digital PR agency, um, carried out an experiment to see if there really was value to no follow links. 
Um, so they created two sites with similar products and copy. So it was all about selling Christmas pet collars. Very glad I managed to get dogs in this. Um, they built follow links to one site and no follow links to the other. They then measured the position of organic keywords using Ahrefs, which is a keyword tool. Um, and they found that the trend shows that the nofollow site saw better improvements in ranking compared to the follow site. So I think that really just highlights that people shouldn't get hung up on whether your links are follow or no follow. Still getting a no follow link is a massive win, um, especially if you're getting it on high domain authoritative websites. Um, not sure if you noticed, but this image was actually adapted with AI. Um, so we did this in Photoshop, which has just linked with AI and yeah, it's quite scary how lifelike it looks. Um, so I've actually put a QR code here. If you are interested in all things AI, um, our head of digital um, has done a presentation and you can download that here. So now moving on to how SEO integrates into digital PR. Um, so SEO integration is vital to enhance your brand exposure and improve search engine rankings. So doing digital PR is great, but ensuring you're adhering to best SEO practices is really where your campaigns will draw that success and further enhance your brand's visibility. Um, so yeah, SEO can really help with keyword rankings, natural link building, and optimizing your content so Google acknowledges it. Writing a blog that gets published is good, but making sure it's optimized for your target keywords is even better. So yeah, link building is important because links are one of the major ranking factors of search engines. Search engines such as Google look at the, the quantity of high quality inbound links to a web page when they crawl. So the higher quality links that you have, the better it will rank. So 92% of marketers believe that links will still be a key ranking factor in Google's algorithm in the next five years, which I think is a really key point considering everything that's going on at the moment with AI. Um, so yeah, link building is here to stay. Um, and experts also believe that link building is the third most important SEO ranking factor after content and keywords. Sorry, just choked that. <coughs> oh dear. Charlotte, just um, on that, somebody's just asked me a question about that. You, you sort of covered it in the bottom point, but they were asking about where it comes in the pecking order. So in terms of how you get them all working together, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously it's still very prevalent. I mean, it's the third post, most important SEO ranking factor. So yes, but somebody was just asking where it where it sits and how much weight you'd give to it. I know that you've seen direct success and results, even from an SEO perspective, purely off the back of digital PR and link mm. building, not only the referral traffic and the brand awareness and all of that side of things. So is it worth mm. talking a little bit about that, the relationship between yeah, where it sits with other SEO tactics. Yes. Yeah, so for as an example, so at the moment um, with some clients, so we might write a monthly blog for them, which is optimized for keywords. Um, and yes, yeah, so we'll write that blog. And then if we think it could be a newsworthy piece, we can actually turn that into a press release. Um, so it may be that has a really interesting hook or an interesting statistic in the blog. Um, we would then update the copy from that blog and turn it into a press release. Um, and we've actually had quite a bit of success from doing that. Um, one brand we work with, we changed a blog that was all about, it's a skincare brand, and we changed a blog that was all about um, the top foods to eat um, to combat menopause symptoms. Um, so we changed that into a press release and we actually ended up getting featured on The Sun, which was very exciting. Um, so yeah, it's a really great way to work with SEO and repurpose it. It's all about repurposing content as well. Um, so yeah, Google and major other major search engines consider backlinks as votes of confidence for the website getting the links. And each vote to so each backlink you get suggests your content is valuable, credible, and useful. So we're now gonna move on to how we do it. So this is our digital PR process. So as I mentioned before, we always start with strategy and ideation. So we start with a backlink audit and really look at your competitors and come up with an analysis to really 
focus on creating a strategic plan on how to improve your backlink profile. Um, we would then conduct research and ideation. So that's thinking about the different types of topics that can link to your brand that could be newsworthy um, and really coming up with some possible campaign ideas. Um, we then move on to production, which is the creation of media assets. Um, and we also work with our SEO team to create content that journalists can link back to, but are also really well optimized. Um, and then we, we then move on to promotion. So that's creating the actual press releases and pitches. And we also create the media distribution lists. Um, so distribution lists can actually differ um, from press release to press release. Um, for each press release you create, we do recommend creating a separate media list just because it could have a different angle. So there could be a wide variety of journalists that you want to contact for one press release. Um, and then finally, we look at link tracking and reporting. So we monitor the coverage and the links we gain um, and we report that back to the clients. So yeah, then thinking about um, how to formulate a strategic digital PR plan, we need to follow um, a systematic approach. So to start with, we really want to identify your audience. So it may mean that you have several different audiences depending on your type of brand. We need to think about what you actually want to talk about and what you need, what you want to be known for. And then you need to carry out some research on where you want to be featured. Um, so hopefully by doing the competitor analysis, you have a rough idea and you might already have some dream publications that you've always wanted to be featured in as well. So thinking about ident identifying your target audience, um, you really need to know everything about them. So you need to understand their age group, what their online behavior consists of, what do they watch, read, listen to? So where, what sites are they going to online? Um, you might have to tailor your tone of voice to each audience. Um, so if you're trying to target different age demographics, that might be, need to be tailored slightly. Um, but we would always recommend that when you're sending your press releases out, that your brand's tone of voice really does come through. You don't want to be featured somewhere and it doesn't sound like your brand at all. And really have a think about what value your content will bring your audience. So then thinking about what do you actually want to talk about? So crafting a compelling message is one of the most important things in both traditional and digital PR. It's all about coming up with that hook and making it newsworthy. Um, it has to be concise and to the point, but eye-catching enough to really grab the reader's attention. So as I mentioned before, really ensure that your brand values, tone of voice and personality come through in the content you're creating. Um, and maybe have a think about if you can find any relevant or current compelling statistics or facts that are related to your content that you could use as a hook if you think there's that newsworthy piece missing. Um, and really think about how you want to come across to your audience. Um, so if you want to be seen as an expert, make sure that you're providing expert commentary. Another few tips, you can also think about um, awareness days. So there seems to be an awareness day for every day of the year now. Um, so I'm sure there'll be some throughout the year that would be relevant to your brand. Um, so when sending a press release, you could always base it around that day or that month. They seem to work really well. Um, and also make sure you keep up with current news affairs and seeing what's happening in the news at the moment. This is where you can really um, help with reactive expert commentary. So I'm just gonna talk through an example that I saw that I really liked. Um, so this was a campaign done by Auto Trader. So they obviously buy and sell used cars um, and they got participants to partake in a hazard perception test. So a driving hazard per perception test um, whilst listening to music. And they then ranked the results from the test based on the artists that they were listening to. So they basically ranked what artists would be the best to listen to whilst driving to help with concentration. 
Um, and I think this is a really nice example. It kind of shows how you don't have to create press releases or campaigns that are directly all about your brand or your product. It can just be a slight nod to what you want to talk about. So obviously <clears throat> this links to Auto Trader because it's all about driving cars, but I don't think they're experts in talking about music artists. So this is just a creative way of how you can create something that's really newsworthy. Um, and yeah, it works really well. So then thinking about where you actually want to be featured. Um, so following your competitor research and your other research, you'll be able to decipher what types of publications you want to be featured in. So we have nationals, which are the high domain authoritative um, publications. So like the Daily Express, the Daily Mirror, for example, um, we have regionals. So those are focusing on publications in specific areas. So if you're a small brand and you've just started out um, yeah, in a local area, targeting regional publications would be really beneficial to really boost your local SEO in particular. Um, and then there's niche publications. So that's to show that you're really experts in your industry, like getting featured on the niche relevant publications that people in your industry are going to be reading. So then having a think about um, the content you want to create for digital PR, um, have a think about what would actually work best for your story. Um, so the content you create has to capture your target audience's attention and really resonate with their needs or questions, for example. Um, storytelling can really enhance your brand image and establish an emotional connection with your audience. Um, so explaining your story, such as how you came up with the product, what your brand values, et cetera, a great way to build a relationship with your audience. So have a think about um, what format your story would work best in, whether that is a blog, um, an infographic, say if you've got loads of different statistics that you want to release to the world, putting that in a nice creative infographic could work really well. Um, a lot of journalists like to feature those, um, or it could just be in a press release and a pitch itself. So just thought we'd talk through an example um, of how to come up with like a creative campaign idea. So I'm sure everyone's heard of Iceland. Um, so they're obviously a supermarket that stock a lot of frozen food. Um, so we had a thought, a think about if we were like the digital PR team for Iceland, um, we would think about the pain points of their customers. What statistics can we get from in-house? And what would actually be newsworthy? And we came up with the idea of avoid the trolley, wa trolley wars, discover the best times to visit Iceland for a hassle-free experience over the Christmas break. Because I think in the news, like just before Christmas time, there's always news about how busy the shops are. It's a frustration for everyone. Um, so if we can get statistics in-house from Iceland on how many shoppers are using their store between different times we can then produce like an infographic or something like that showing this is the best day and the best time to visit to do your shop to avoid trolley pools um, so yeah I thought that would be a good creative idea and um, this image was created with AI as well it's just baffling my mind at the moment how powerful it is um, so then I think the best way to start trying to think creatively is to look at previous examples. Um, so I've linked two newsletters here, which they basically send a roundup of loads of digital PR campaigns they've seen throughout the week. And they link them all and say why they like them and why they've worked effectively. And you can look at those for inspiration. Um, and more often than not, on a digital PR campaign, at the bottom of the page, there will be a methodology. Um, so this will show you how that team actually came up with that campaign idea or how they actually got the statistics or things like that, which is really useful um, when you're trying to think of ideas to come up with. Um, so we've talked quite a bit about AI, but using AI is really helpful 
Um, just very quickly, Char, we had a question. It might be good just, yeah. if I could just chip in with it now. Somebody just popped a question in the mm -hmm. chat. Are these ones specifically B to C? If so, do we have any B to B examples? I mean, I know we as an agency work a lot with B to B organisations and digital PR for, uh, for B to B. But how about those resources? Do they cover B to B subject matter yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's they send through so many, to be honest. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different businesses on there. Um, so yeah, have a look. Definitely sign up. Um, what, and yeah. What are your thoughts as well? I know it's probably not a one size fits all, but just on that, uh, you know, the relationship between digital PR and link building for B2B versus B2C, you know, when you're working with clients mm -hmm. and one is B2B and the other is B2C, they might work in completely contrasting industries or sectors. Do you approach it in different ways? Do you, um, yeah, follow the same process? I mean, obviously niche industry publications and trade are going to be more associated with B2B, but yeah, mm -hmm. I guess what's your thought on that and the, and the, and the key differences if there are any? Yeah, no, I think it's definitely following the same process. Um, but it's obviously really thinking about what journalists you're trying to target and what publications you want to be featured in. So that's where for each different brands, if you're B2B or B2C, we'd carry out the, that competitor analysis to really identify where you need to be featured. Um, so we, yeah, like Dan said, we have different B2B and B2C clients. Um, so yeah, sometimes B2C can be a bit more um, like national style. So thinking about the Daily Mail and things like that. Um, and B2B can be a lot more focused on the relevancy link. So more niche publications. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> um, so then, yeah, we just talked a bit about using AI to assist with your creative inspiration. Um, so this is in, just in chat GPT. So again, focusing on dogs. I said, can you come up with some campaign ideas about dogs? And it's just a really good starting point to get your brain to try and think outside of the box. Um, all I will say is please don't use AI to write your pitches or your press releases. Um, journalists can actually really tell the difference. And I actually read a report yesterday from, um, I can't remember the name of the agency, but they had interviewed loads of journalists. And yeah, it was quite a high percentage of journalists would be put off if they realised that your content was created solely with AI. Um, so yeah. And then moving on to how we actually outreach. So you need to build your media list, which is your distribution list. So who you're actually going to send your content to. Um, and there's various different tools you can use to get journalist email, journalist email details. Um, so one example that I find really works is using X or Twitter. I still always call it Twitter as well. <laughs> um, so you can use the hashtag journal requests. Um, and a lot of journalists use these to tweet looking for experts to comment on a story. Um, so this way you can either message them directly or sometimes they have their email address like in their bio. Um, you can also use trusty Google. So if you've seen an article on a publication that you really like and you think you could contribute to, um, you can see the author of the article online and then just stalk them a little bit um google their name and see if their email comes up sorry carry on yeah um there's also some paid subscriptions that you can use so rox hill is an amazing tool which is basically a massive database of journalist contacts um so it has like their email it often includes like a bio of what they're actually interested in seeing. Um, that is quite expensive, but that's kind of where you can use an agency to help you really build those media lists. Um, and the same with PR Max. So that's another paid subscription. Um, and that shows you upcoming features that they might be featuring on their website as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different tools, um, some free and some not, but yeah. So then thinking about how you draft your pitch. So this is the part of the email before your actual press release. Um, so one of the most important things is your subject line. If you think about it, if your subject line looks spammy or uninteresting, the journalist is just going to press delete without even opening your email. 
Um, so you need to really make sure it stands out. As well as your subject line, the first sentence is really important. Um, so it really has to grab the journalist's attention and make them want to read your full press release. Um, so include your relevant source or your statistic in the first sentence so that they can see that you've actually got credible information. Um, and basically give an overview of the key points to your press release. So you can use bullet points to really like um, refine that and make it snappy so they can just read that and think, oh yeah, I'm interested. And then you can expand further in your press release below. Um, we've also found that the best time to send a pitch is between 8.30 a.m. and 10 a.m. I tend to send mine at 8.24. I know it's very precise, but I just think it looks a bit less spammy than 8.30 on the dot. Um, so media lists can obviously end up having hundreds of contacts on them. Um, and you can use a tool to bulk send these emails or you can send them individually through your email platform. Um, I'd just say, just make sure that you're personalizing each email. Um, again, in this report I read recently, journalists said that they would be put off if they thought that they were getting a bulk send email. So you need to make sure that you include their first name um, and always make sure that you include your contact information because they might ask you for additional comments or yeah, for yeah, any questions or anything. So then we've just listed out um, like a bit of a template of what you can use. So you have your captivating subject line and then ask how they are. They are human too. Um, reference your key reliable source or statistic. Always ask to be credited to. So I think a lot of people think it's cheeky, but I think you won't get unless you ask. So I always just put, um, if you do reference these tips or use this comment, please can you credit and then link your website. Um, always offer unique copy and quotes um, because the journalist might think that they would want an exclusive so they can come back to you with questions. Um, and always include a blurb about your brand. So it's really important to describe why you're sending this, like what is your brand about and why are you a credible source? Like why should they feature you? Um, and then always send a follow-up if you don't get a reply. Um, and a tip with a follow-up, use a different subject line. So um, keep in the RE on the email, but change up the subject line because if they haven't opened it the first time, you might want to create something that's a little bit more catchy or like hook worthy um, to try and get them to open it. So it's a bit like A-B testing. Um, and yeah, I found quite a lot of success with my follow-up. So yeah, make sure you try that. So then thinking about reactive requests. So they're a great way to get featured as an expert in your field in different publications. And um, so, as I mentioned before, journalists often put on Twitter saying that they need an expert to comment on X, Y, and Z, um, but they are very timely and often have very tight deadlines. Um, so yeah, it's basically journalists wanting an expert to confirm or deny their findings about their story. And there's various different tools you can use um, to get notified of these requests. So there's one called Help a B2B Writer, um, and you can basically sign up and select what industries you're um, focusing on or what you can comment on. So I've received this email about SEO, and you can see the publication that you'd be featured in and their domain authority, which I think is really nice to have in there. Um, and you can basically reply to that with your comment and then you have a chance of being featured on there. And then there's another tool called Quoted, which works in exactly the same way. Um, and they also provide weekly updates um, of comments they've asked for, which again is really beneficial. So one thing I would say is do not be put off if you don't get a reply from a journalist. Um, digital PR is really challenging and you have to face a lot of rejection. Um, but journalists receive a lot of emails. 28% um, actually receive over 100 pitches per week. Um, and a lot of those are apparently reported to be irrelevant. 
So I would say that you really have to make sure that the content you're sending to these journalists is relevant to what they actually cover and what their users would like to see. If you're sending them um, like content that isn't relevant, say if you sent a travel journalist um, things about politics, he might just end up replying to you saying, can you remove me from your media list? Um, and we would also recommend only following up once to a pitch that you've sent. Um, it's just the same process. If you continually bomb bombard them, you're at risk of um, them blocking you, for example. Um, so yeah, it's really important to build relationships with journalists. And I think that's where you start to draw the success because journalists can actually come to you for expert comments once they know that you actually provide good comments and timely as well. Just very quickly, sorry, Charlotte, some of the tools you shared a couple of slides ago and the various tools throughout the presentation, somebody's dropped a note just to ask if they are uh, international tools or just purely uh, for the UK. I'm not sure if there's a mixture or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're international. Um, so, yeah, I think when you sign up, you can actually select your location or where you want to target. Um, so, yeah, they can all be tailored to you, what you receive. So, yeah, they're really good. Um just going to talk you through a reactive comment example. So I saw this tweet, tweet, what do you call them X's now? I don't know. On I saw this tweet on X um, and a journalist was looking for gardening experts. Um, so I just emailed this journalist and said, hey, I work with this brand um, we can provide comments really quickly. Let me know if you need anything in the future. Um, so again, she used the hashtag journal request. So definitely check that one out if you can. Um, so a few weeks later, so the journalist replied to that one just saying thank you. And then a few weeks later, um, she actually asked if we're still working with that brand and could we answer these questions? Um, and she gave a 4.30 PM deadline for the same day. So I think I had a couple of hours to get the comments. Um, so we got the comments from our client and sent them over before the deadline. And we got featured in Ideal Home um, with a link as well. So, and they have a DA of 66, um, which is really good. And obviously it's a really um, relevant publication to our brand as well. So that was a really big win. Um, so just going to talk through a nationals case studies, how we got featured in national um, publications. So this was for our gardening client as well. So the original pitch and press release we sent referenced the fact that it was International Gardening Month and International Pet Month, in the same month. Um, so we found a, a statistic on the Royal Horticultural Society's website that wildflowers are still a really popular trend um so we then came up with a press release listing um what types of wildflowers are harmful to your pets and how they could be harmful so we kind of broke down each flower and then wrote i can't remember how they are actually poisonous but yeah detailed how they could be harmful to pets so we sent that to our media list and I waited very patiently, like this dog. And then we managed to get links in the Daily Mirror and the Daily Express um, for that piece. And so these have domain authority scores of 94 and 93, which is pretty much the highest you can get. So yeah, we were over the moon with that one. And then just to show you a niche and relevancy case study, so this was for one of our home care clients. Um, we came up with the idea of thinking about um, how elderly people can lose weight as they get older and why that should be a concern. So we got some statistics together, included that in the press release. We also partnered with a nutritionist. Um, so this really gave us a bit more additional credibility and insight. Um, and we included tips on how to encourage the elderly to eat. So I think some of the tips were like have a colourful um, plate of food and things like that. And then we listed the best snacks for weight gain and included their benefits. So gave different snack ideas and then, um, yeah, why 
they should be eating that snack. And then this one did really well. So we got um, quite a few links and these are just some of the features. So we got featured in Care Talk Business, Home Care Insight and Psych Reg, which are all really relevant publications to our client's brand. Um, and they have DAs of 21, 39 and 52. Um, so yeah, that was a really big win for us as well. So just to note, like through sending out one press release, you can get multiple links from multiple publications. So now just thinking about how to actually report on success. So we utilize GA4 to look at things like referral traffic and conversions. Um, so alongside an SEO strategy, digital PR can really help boost those results and um, so yeah we monitor those on a monthly basis but you can also look at um the amount of inbound links you're getting so we have a link tracker for every client and we obviously keep that up to date and then report on that monthly um and that'll include like the domain authority score of the link if it's a follow no follow things like that um and again you can look at this in moz to see how many links you've got per month um and then obviously also you want to monitor your keyword ranking performance. So the more you're actively getting and building back things, the more that can help with your organic performance in the SERPs. That is the end of my presentation. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Charlotte. So no, it was really insightful. And obviously you managed to beat the... Um... Beat the challenges of the power cut and the Wi-Fi and the lights going off and all. So well, yeah. well done on that. Sorry, well done on yeah, that. that. Um, <laughs> Bab. So yeah, folks, thank you so much. We're going to open up for some questions. I've had um, I popped in the chat actually. Our charity partner um, for the year, Youth Talk. These webinars are completely free. So just to give a little bit of a shout out to Youth Talk, our charity partner. We are actually running and walking. Various people are doing different things. We're running and walking the St Albans um half marathon isn't it in a, cu uh, a couple of weeks time so um, there's lots of activity we've got somebody doing a mammoth swim challenge as well so we're doing a lot over the coming months but please don't hesitate to jump on that link and um, give a small donation um in just a couple of pounds all adds up so so we appreciate that um please also don't hesitate to uh, leave us a review on google you can google wagon a digital cheltenham for our cheltenham office or indeed st albans and just drop a view a review on the google business profile listing there that is obviously very very much appreciated um but we will send uh, we will send the links through um i'll open up to questions i've had a couple come through privately so i'm just going to pose one to you first if that's okay charlotte somebody that messaged me about five ten minutes ago so um you talked a little bit earlier about um campaigns and campaign angles somebody's asked the question what guidance can you give for inspiration to find creative campaigns and creative stories so what's your view on that you know sometimes it's not as you say it's not directly relating to the product or exactly what it is that a company does it's about what they can get involved with. So where do you start with some of that in terms of trying to catch the eye of uh, digital content creators and digital journalists? Yeah, so um, what we do at the start of the process, so within our ideation, we create like a main ideation doc um, and we work together as a team to put down all the different topics that could be related to that brand. Um, so like the different niches that you could tap into. Um, and we then do a lot of research in like current news to see what competitors have done um, and write down some examples and link some examples. And we tend to always refer back to that when we're ideating. Um, and then we also like those newsletters that I linked, we always constantly look at examples. Um, so yeah, it is hard to get um, the creative brain working, but I find that having that ideation doc, you kind of always have something to refer back to to get you like jog your memory of what you could start to think about um and just using a whiteboard as well or a piece of paper and just honestly thinking about the most random things and don't let don't let anything stop you from writing things down and um, that's sometimes when the best ideas can actually come about um so yeah I had another question as well. How long do you spend on campaigns from start to finish? So how long would you and and how long do you spend on outreach? So I guess the campaign itself and yeah, maybe talk a little bit about outreach and that side of things. Yeah. Um, so it can differ from campaign to campaign. So 
obviously if you're just repurposing a blog into a press release that can be done quite quickly so I don't know I can't really put a time on it because <laughs> um, it is different for each piece of content but if you're creating assets to go with your campaign so infographic um, I don't know even a video or images like that can obviously take a lot longer um, and again if you're compiling statistics or if you've undertaken a survey or things like that again that can be um a lot longer process um but yeah i think when you're working on those bigger campaigns um making sure you're still looking out for those reactive opportunities really helps to continue the momentum if you know what i mean um and then outreach so what we tend to do is build the media list and then we will, so we use a tool to bulk send um, and we schedule one email to go out um, during the week at 8.24 and then we schedule the follow-up to go out two days later um, and then if we don't hear anything back after that, we stop. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the outreach process. Um, we've got a question here because we've got a couple more questions coming through. So keep them coming through, folks. Um, how do we decide on a goal for what the domain authority should be? So we talked a little bit about DA domain authority earlier on. What mm. is how long is a piece of string, isn't it? But how how what you know what does good look like in that area? So that's what we would identify from the competitor analysis. So really looking at what your competitors have got. Um, so again. It's a bit mathematical, but we basically figure out the percentage of um, domain authority scores each competitor has. And there's more often than not a trend of where your competitors have um, their links and what domain authority scores they have. And then we make those the targets. Um, so to give you an example, say if one competitor had links from websites that have scores between 40 and 50, but you don't have any with those scores, that might be where you target. Thank you for that, Charlotte. And do you have any advice about where to find case studies to accompany your press release? Can I just check on that one? Is that regarded? No, no, that's fine. Just so do you have any advice about where to find case studies to accompany your press release? Jessica, just um, maybe drop me a note or a mute if there was anything specifically there in terms of if it was you were looking to evidence your own, perhaps your, is it your own brand's work, just so we can understand. Um, whilst Jessica's doing that, does anybody else have any questions that they wanted to ask? Feel free to unmute as well if anybody did want to pose it in the room. Yes, yeah, so... Yeah, so what's your thought, Charlotte, on how you would position things like case studies to reinforce your own brand's work, what it is that you're doing, or ways to then, uh, would you accompany a press release with evidence successes? And if so, how do you uh, go about doing that? Yes, yes, definitely. So if you've, um, yeah, if you've got an amazing case study, the thing is, you always have to think about what is the hook for that press release. So Say if you've got a case study and um, it includes loads of statistics on how you actually made a difference, I don't know, environmentally, say, for instance, your brand works environmentally, um, then that would be a really interesting piece. Um, so, yeah, I'd always say you have to think back to what's actually going to be newsworthy. Um, and if you think there is a chance that your case study could be, or if there's something going on in the news at the moment that kind of relates to your case study, you could link it to that. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, any final questions? No? Fab. Well, folks, it's been really great to have you on this session. Um, as I say, you will get a copy of the recording. You will get a full follow-up. Um, if you have any further questions, anything off the back of today that you'd like to find out more from any of our digital experts in our London, St Albans or Cheltenham offices, um, you know, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. As you can see on the screen, we're not just digital PR experts. You know, We do the full mix of digital marketing from SEO and Google Ads right the way through to digital PR and paid and organic social media. Um, we do website development, we're HubSpot partners as well, we do sales and marketing alignment through HubSpot, build full websites in HubSpot and WordPress. 
Um, and we do employer branding. So recruitment marketing, we support you in that uh, ever present recruitment crisis that brands across the UK and internationally are, are feeling at the moment. So there's some lovely messages coming through, lots of people with lots of thanks and people have found it very informative. So I really do appreciate it. Please don't hesitate to pop online, leave us a little review, perhaps shout out about the session on LinkedIn. Uh, that always goes a long way as well. And please don't hesitate to offer a small charity donation to our charity partner, Youth Talk. But in the meantime, all the very best with your digital PR efforts. Let us know if we can support you further and have a great rest of the day and a good weekend. And enjoy Silverstone in six weeks time. I will. All right. Cheers, everybody. Take care. <laughs> Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye, -bye.